He act like you guys flew into the <coughs> airport here. Have you been here like, before, Mike? Yeah, a couple times. Okay, a couple times. So, yeah. Copper River Delta. And it's asymmetric, right, because of the longshore current. So the delta is mostly west of the river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit over here to the east. Um, Prince William Sound, of course. Um, this is all deep fjords, glacial fjords. Um, and then you see these valley glaciers coming off the delta here. Same thing, you know, this... Um, at the last ice ages or ice sheets going out towards the continental shelf, sea level is 200 feet lower. They retreated, scoured out big valleys, but also the ice that was blocking the copper broke. And, um, you know, we have the Copper River. It was a pro-glacial lake on the other side, Lake Atna. That was a whole upper basin uh -huh. flowing towards Cook Inlet or the Yukon yes. for, um, you know, whatever, a uh, long, long period of time. About 9,000 years ago, it failed. Um, you started having water flowing out to the Gulf again through the mountains, bringing all that glacial silt. It's about 18% glaciated today, the Copper Basin, it's the Copper Catchment, it's about the size of West Virginia. Hmm. And then all that silt, it's, it's the sixth largest catchment in Alaska, the second highest discharge, and it's tied with the Yukon for the most sediment production. So a lot of silt and sand coming out of this river, and that filled in these fjords here and created this delta that has a you know a thickness of 180 meters in places of silt and sand um and so you have these distinct and then the other so you have um, glacial influences then because then these um glaciers that are closer to town here were able to advance out onto the delta surface and deposit gravel um and moraines you know either you know with fluvial processes or with just the ice pushing up moraines so we'll see signs of that today. Um, you have the marine influence because that longshore current deposited these glacial marine sediments from coming out of the copper. And so you have all these kind of more finer grained stuff on the estuarian edge and in these barrier islands that are just out of view right here. And then you have the, the tectonic processes. So this area is prone to earthquakes. And on our boat trip this morning, we'll see evidence of um, up the uplift and subsidence cycle that we have going on here. And we'll talk about that more in detail. So. Um, and so in this short section, we have all <coughs> these different geomorphic influences resulting in really um, dramatic differences across the landscape. So we're going to head out the road with these guys here to 22 Mile. We'll just boat up. They're just working in this pond. It's just a two-minute boat ride up from the ramp. Shuttle them up. We'll abscond their boat, and we'll run up to McKinley Lake and Salmon Creek. Um, Salmon Creek is a U-shaped valley that's one of our um, primary sites for a lot of our coho temperature stuff. Um, we'll drop the boat back with them and we'll hop in the car and we'll drive out here at least to Flag Point where we'll be able to see the copper. Um, and then we'll stop 25 mile as a Spring Creek system. Note that it's on this outwash below the Saddlebag Glacier. Um, and so you see there's no waterways on the map right here. It's kind of odd in Cordova, right? All that water is just going into the ground mm -hmm. and upwelling as spring creeks out here on these. And these are outwash materials deposited both by this glacier and also by the, you know, from glaciers down the copper. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we'll come along and we'll stop. In this area, there's this um, granitic intrusion here that um, kind of blocked glacier advance. You can see we have glaciers on this side, glaciers on that side and kind of a little bit of a driftless area here in the middle. Um, and it has a very different character. So we'll look at some of the streams there that are more surface water dominated. Then you cross back onto an outwash here. This is 18 Mile Creek. You can see this little finger of outwash that ducked through there is now diked off. Um, but it's our reach there is strongly downwelling and it's right on the edge of these muskegs So there's a lot of surface water entering. So even though it's kind of on outwash gravels that we characterize that as a surface water site um, And then we'll come back to town and we'll go up Power Creek here and this would have been another one of these u-shaped um, glacial outwashes but there, this is the whole mountainside collapsed mm. and made this canyon and um, kind of isolated the upper part of the valley from the lake. And, um, but then also on those landslide debris, a lot of water gets in there and comes out in the form of groundwater just downstream. And it's a really productive fish spawning spot. Um, so that's kind of a overview of where we'll go. And Cordy we'll mentioned that there was uh, uh, three meters of uplift during the 64 
Oh okay. yeah. Um, yep. So out here, it was probably on average um, was about two meters, but certainly in places three meters. Mm -hmm. um, and out on Montague Island, actually, they had up to ten meters of uplift on this little slip strike fault that they had. But yes, yeah, so and we'll see good evidence of that today. And that's if you look at this textured kind of wetland area on this map, kind of through here. That's roughly where. Um, tide line went up to before 64 earthquake. I, if there wasn't tidal influence at Eak Lake, it was close. There was tidal influence up to this McKinley Lake. You'll see today this river that we're going to run in a jet boat where we'll be bouncing off logs almost. They used to take sane boats up into there. You'll see it'll be amazingly different. Um, and so that really changed the landscape on this portion. These outwashes were higher at elevation and weren't as affected, but you'll see a bunch of dead trees and stuff. What's doing that is the, the shifting of meltwater on these outwash surfaces and in particular this scott glacier is land terminating so it's like a fire hose that no one's holding on to because it's pumping out a ton of sediment coarse material uh -huh. and it's pushing the flows around uh -huh. um, sheridan and um, saddlebag glaciers terminate into big lakes so all that coarse mm -hmm. material falls out and so the rivers are more are, are more incised and, just, and hold a more stable channel and you'll see that stability reflected in the vegetation on the outwashes when you're out there Super. Thanks, Luca. Thank you, guys. Great orientation. Good night.